have been built and civilizations lost over gold. So you might find it hard to believe that we have too much gold here on planet Earth. You might find it even harder to believe that the discovery of gravitational waves has something to say about this question of why we have more gold here on the Earth than we expect. Now, I'm a quantum astrophysicist, so you might find it hardest of all to believe I have anything to do with this. So let me tell you the story, and that story begins a little over 100 years ago with Albert Einstein and his theory of general relativity. This is the same theory that told us that gravity is not a force, but space-time warpage. It's the same theory that gave us black holes, and it also gave us this idea that space-time can ripple and make waves called gravitational waves. About two years ago, in early 2016, scientists announced that we had, for the first time, discovered gravitational waves from the collision of two black holes. Now, this was a very exciting discovery at the time, and what I want to do today is to take you past that moment of first discovery to what's been going on since then. So, what was seen in those first discoveries with a pair of black holes that collided with each other, gave off gravitational waves. Those gravitational waves traveled 1.3 billion light years and, and were measured by the detectors of the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, or LIGO. Now, LIGO took 100 years, LIGO and its, 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 its partners in Europe, Virgo, took a oh, little over 100 years to measure these waves uh, predicted by Einstein. Why did it take so long? Well, it took so long because these gravitational waves are extremely faint. How faint, you might ask? Well, let me tell you what the measurement was that LIGO did with that first black hole. When the gravitational waves pass through the detectors of LIGO, LIGO has mirrors that are four kilometers apart, two and a half miles, and those mirrors moved by less than one thousandth of a single proton width when the gravitational wave went by. That's how faint they are. That was the measurement that was made, so you should be awed that humans can make such a precise measurement. <laughs> Now, what does it take to make a measurement like that? Well, you need to keep in mind two factors of a trillion. The one factor of a trillion is going to come from how still do you need to make the mirrors of LIGO, and the second factor of a trillion is going to come from how in the world do you measure such a small distance. So, the first factor of a trillion, if I took a mirror and I just plopped it down here at my feet and asked, how much do you move, mirror? That mirror would move by about one micron, or a millionth of a meter, which is a trillion times bigger than the LIGO measurement, which was 10 to the minus 18 meters. That's your first factor of a trillion. You have to take the mirror and instrument it with vibration isolation systems and, and put it in a vacuum system and tame its motion by a factor of a trillion. We did that. Then came the next problem. The mirror is sitting so still, how do we make such a measurement? And there comes our friend, the L in LIGO stands for laser. The laser light has a, a, a wavelength that we use as the tick marks on our ruler. So the laser light we use happens to be near infrared, not so far from the visible spectrum. It also happens to have a wavelength of one micron, 10 to the minus six meters. But we need to make a measurement that's 10 to the minus 18 meters. What that means is that we need to measure something which is a trillion times smaller than the spacing of the tick marks on our ruler. How do we do that? Well, we do that by using lots and lots and lots of photons, extremely high powers in LIGO, so we can average over the properties of all those photons. And in fact, in, in advanced LIGO, eventually there will be almost a megawatt of laser power circulating. Now, all of the, this development of this instrumentation took a while, and that, that's why it took 100 years for this discovery, but that was not all. We also had to, in the meantime, learn how to solve Einstein's equations mathematically. Very, very difficult, in fact, beastly equations. And that took a lot of good mathematics and computing power. The other thing we had to learn to do was to extract very, very faint signals from very noisy data. Again, a, a great computational and mathematical coup. 
But you put all of those things together, and indeed, in, in September 2015, the first gravitational waves from the cosmos were registered in the detectors of LIGO. You might imagine that was a time to pack our bags and go home and rest on our laurels, but of course not. A, we don't do that. B, there's too much of the universe still to be seen. So what happened next? Well, th since then, there have been 10, uh, uh, a total of 10 confirmed observations of black holes that orbit each other and collide, binary black hole collisions, we call them. But in the meantime, all, a little bit under two, uh, two years after that first black hole discovery, another spectacular event in the, in the cosmos made its way to the LIGO and Virgo detectors. And that came in the form of a pair of neutron stars that are orbiting each other and collide, just as black holes do. Now, for those of you who haven't really paid much attention to neutron stars, you can think of them as the lighter cousins of black holes. They just weigh a little bit less. They're formed in the same ways as black holes are, but because black holes have a lot of, uh, of gravity, they implode all the way down to a black hole. A neutron star kind of gets stuck being an extremely dense star. It has about the mass of our sun but it's contained in a star the radius of about 10 kilometers. So very, very massive, compact object. Now, another lovely thing about neutron stars compared to black holes is that neutron stars are made of neutrons. <laughs> neutrons, actually, when they collide, give off a spectacular light show. So on that, that fateful uh, day in, on, in uh, uh, July 17, 2017, LIGO and Virgo saw the signatures of a, a neutron star collision, the first ever seen. Shortly after that, a gamma ray telescope in the sky, the Fermi Gamma Ray Telescope, saw a burst of gamma rays. And this set off an, ex an, an, an incredible network of alerting all our astronomer friends with a, that we have seen the collision of two neutron stars in the patch of sky. The patch of sky happened to be in the southern hemisphere. When we saw the, the, the event in our detectors, it was daytime there. So we had stuff roughly, astronomers had roughly 11 hours to prepare their telescopes to point to that patch of sky and look for this brand new object in the sky. This is an object that should have been dark because when the neutron stars are orbiting each other at some distance, they're not emitting light. But when they collide, all of those neutrons are crushing together and giving off enormous amounts of energy and light. And indeed, over 70 telescopes pointed at the sky that night, and the new object was found by many. In every color of light you can imagine, from optical to infrared to radio waves to ultraviolet, X-rays and gamma rays. It was a very exciting time. But you might ask, well, so you saw for the first time an object with gravity and with light. That might have been spectacular enough, but we learned many new things, and I will tell you about one of them. For a long time, we have not understood how on our planet we have as much gold and platinum and heavy elements as we do. We believe that the elements that our planet is made of and our solar system come from stars, and of course, we, could, we need to look no farther than our own star, the sun. But it turns out that stars like the sun don't fuse elements heavier than iron or nickel. Anything heavier in the periodic table needs to come from somewhere else because the sun just doesn't have the energy or the neutron-rich source to do that. Well, the next candidate was that they come from explosions of stars, like supernovae, and that has been measured, but again, it does not account by any measure for all the gold and heavy elements we see here on the Earth. So the remaining candidate was we need to look somewhere in the universe where there are lots and lots of neutrons because heavy nuclei, heavy elements means heavy nuclei, means we need lots of neutrons and protons to build those nuclei. So it was believed that those could come from the collisions of neutron stars, and indeed, from all the different colors of light that we saw from this gravitational wave-triggered event, we saw the formation of gold and platinum and the heavy elements. In fact, many, many tens of times the mass of our Earth was fused into those elements in that one event. So we now understand where gold comes from. Now, when I was a kid, Carl Sagan, the, the you know, astronomer and, 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 and science popularizer, you know, taught us that we are all stardust. I think we have to modify that. We now understand we are all neutron stardust. <laughs> okay? 
Well, do we stop here? Of course not. We have a whole universe to map out in gravitational waves. And in fact, the most exciting thing that could come out of this field now is the discovery of things we haven't thought of that nature threw at us that we hadn't imagined. So what do we do? We have to keep improving our instruments. Can we stop at an instrument that can measure 10 to the minus 18 meters of displacement? Of course not. So let me tell you about one technology that we are using that, that it has improved the instruments of advanced LIGO recently. So the measurement that we make uses laser light. And I told you the, 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 the tick marks of our, of our ruler are the wavelength of the laser light. But now comes another fundamental force of nature, quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics tells us that all measurements are inherently uncertain. And the way that you can imagine this in the terms of a ruler and a measurement is imagine I gave you a ruler and I asked you to measure the length of a piece of paper. But in fact, my ruler was governed by the laws of quantum mechanics and the tick marks on my ruler are continuously sloshing. The spacing between the tick marks is moving around. You make a measurement of the piece of paper and what kind of measurement would that be? Pretty lousy, right? Because every time you measure, you get a different answer. So we have used quantum technologies to engineer a special uh, state of light called a squeeze state, where we can actually make the, the, uh, the spacing of the tick marks less flickering, so more steady than quantum mechanics would normally allow. You might be alarmed that I'm violating the laws of quantum mechanics when I do this, but I don't. The way that we get around this with these squeeze states of light is that even though the spacing between our tick marks is flickering less, is sloshing less, the height of my tick marks is, is, is flickering more. But to make the, a measurement of a length of piece of paper, I don't care about the height of the tick mark. I only care about the spacing of the tick marks. And that allows me to, to, to use this quantum technology in advanced LIGO. And in fact, advanced LIGO just began its third observing run. And we are now observing the mergers of these compact binaries like black holes and neutron stars about once per week instead of once per month, in, in greatly aided by these quantum technologies. So this is the journey of one quantum astrophysicist. I hope you can see we can tie these things together. We take the esoteric ideas of quantum mechanics and we apply them to tease out the mysteries of the dark and warped universe. I do this with an incredibly talented team of students and, uh, and colleagues. And so I just want you to know that the future is extremely dark and warped for <laughs> observing the universe with gravitational waves. Thank you. <laughs>